as we continue our study in the essential attitudes of the Christian, the the two that we have picked, um, open up your Bibles with me to the letter to the Colossians, the third chapter, Colossians 3, as you're turning there, I just want to extend a, a special thank you to all of you who thanked me for the sermon this morning. I appreciated your very unique humor, all of you. It was nice to know that you were angry at the sermon. All of you, very unique. Thank you very much for that, those flattering words. Let's read Colossians 3. We're going to read right past the verses that we are going to focus on, but we're going to read the whole section 3, 1 through 17. Paul writes this, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them but now you also lay them all aside wrath anger malice slander and abusive speech from your mouth do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with its evil practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. So, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and graciously forgiving each other. Who, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. Above all these things, put on love which is the perfect bond of unity. And and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, in, in one body, and be thankful. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, who has graciously, mercifully put us in Christ, hidden with us with Him and in Him, and will soon uh, cause us to be manifested with Him in our glorified state, we praise You this evening. And we, we consecrate and dedicate this time to You and to the worship of You through the sanctification of our inner being. Please work on Your church and be gracious to us today through the cutting, provoking Word from you. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. There is a famous, at least to me, 
a, a very famous camp counselor prayer request. Now, this doesn't happen at our camps, but I've, I've heard this prayer request, both of these prayer requests, often when the camp counselors are all gathering around for their meeting in the morning to talk about the hardships of the last night and all the sleep that didn't happen. Somebody will raise their hand in, 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 to, to offer up a prayer request for themselves, and they, will, they won't say the prayer request. They will say this, I have an unspoken. Yeah, I guess, I, I guess it's nice to know I understand what's going on. Sometimes you don't want to give all the details of things. And sometimes it's nice to know that there's a, there's a problem. There's a problem that I can be praying for, but it always kind of makes me feel like you have a problem with someone, i.e. me, in this room. And you just don't want to tell me. Just a thought. But that, that's, not, that's not as famous as the other common prayer request. I, I, pardon me if I'm stepping on any of your toes and offending you. I don't mean to. Actually, I totally do. But uh, please do not be too offended by this next prayer request that's a common one at some camps, right? People raise their hand to, to, to ask for prayer, and they say, please pray for me concerning the P word. The P word? I, I, I think what you're saying is patience. P- please pray for my patience, because it's really being tested here this week. But I don't even understand the prayer request, right? Are, are, you, are you suggesting that it's as if, as if actually saying patience, uh, God will start working on your patience? Do you, do you not want him to work on your patience? Are you afraid if you say patience, he's going to start causing things to come into your life that will actually challenge your patience? So do you want patience or do you not? What kind of a prayer request is this? Sorry if I'm stepping on your toes. Isn't that essentially saying, though, that you don't want God to work on your patience? I mean, I appreciate the fact that you recognize that you have a patience problem, but not even being able to acknowledge it? It seems to me, now, now maybe I'm reading into things a little bit more, it seems to me that the truth is the last thing you actually want to work on is your patience. That's why you can't even say the word for fear of it. These prayer requests, I would say, present a whole attitude towards sin that starts in the wrong place. You shouldn't focus on you. You shouldn't focus on the people in your life that are causing problems. Focusing on people and problems is never the right place to start, I would suggest. That's never where Christians are called to start, at least. Christians are called to start at a totally different place, in a a Godward attitude and focus. That is where they begin to work on the Christian life. The, The Christian walks with complete practical diligence because, first and foremost, their mind is set on things above. And and we even see this in Colossians, right? Look at those first few verses in this chapter even, right? We are called to set our minds on things above. We're not supposed to start out by looking at the world around us and all the difficulties we have in our life and the trouble and sanctification we have. No, we are called to first be, notice what Paul says, keep seeking the things that are above. It's to be the the characteristic of our life, ongoing thoughtfulness above verse 2 we are to be setting our minds on things above that's where we start that's where you start on things above what do you see what do you think on when you start setting your mind there first in the morning begin to recognize things you begin to recognize number one you are new you are new verses one and two That's where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And and you are with Him. You also begin to see when you set your mind on things above that you are different as well. You have died and you have been raised with Him. You are new. You are different. And you also begin to see that you are secure as well. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
That's where the Christian life starts. It starts with God and focusing on Him. That's where all practical diligence begins. That's where every prayer request begins. Lord, I am seeking the things that are above, not here, ultimately. And I'm choosing to believe spiritual things. Not what my eyes can see, but true spiritual things. I'm setting my mind upward. How do you know that your mind is pointed upward? Well, it seems very clear that Paul shows you what it looks like when your mind is pointed upward, when you start your day with an upward focus. You put off the old. We see that in in 4 through 8. And notice also we have certain motivations to do this. Verse 9, we have put off the old man in some real and and permanent sense. We, We no longer live that way because we are no longer to be identified, characterized with that man. We have put on the new man, which is being renewed in the knowledge of Christ. And also... We, as we put on the new man, notice one of the things that we put on. We have to put on patience. Verse 12 and following. The new man is new actions, new attitudes. And for a time this evening, I want to focus on that uh, one, of those, one of those characteristics of the new man. It's the characteristic of patience. And I, and I want to work out an explanation for what is true Christian patience. What is true spiritual patience? We're going to be looking at descriptions, a few descriptions of what true spiritual patience is and what it looks like. Well, the first description that we have for us in these verses for our time this evening is this. True spiritual patience is essential. It's essential in the Christian's life. You see it there in verse 12. Yeah, you, you are the elect of God, holy, beloved. You, you, you put on these things. You put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. And then notice that, patience. It's, a, it's an essential feature. Now, when you look up the word patience and you look at the, the words, all the words that are used, there are many New Testament words. There's also a really fun Old Testament word, and I want to share it with you. It means that you have a long nose. Now, the Hebrews have a very a visual way of describing things, and in their mind, the anger in your heart caused your face to redden up. And then your nose would get red. And that's how you knew someone was angry. But if you had a long nose, it means you are slow to anger. You you are slow going all the way Rudolph on anyone. Because you've got a long nose. There's two significant uh, New Testament Greek words. One means just wait. But the other one, the one that we have here, seems to mean an idea of long-suffering or a willingness to wait, a a willingness to bear under something. and Essentially, it's a a willingness to wait for God's outcome without sinfully sinfully forsaking obedience to Him and doing it your own way. It's it's a willingness to wait for, for God's outcome, God's work, God's sovereign purposes without resorting to sinful behaviors and pursuing your own outcome your way. Patience then is is a strength to continue in the place that he has put you and not give up. Patience is a strength to face hardships, whether those are relational or or parental, and and not to abandon your God in the struggle. Not Not to go... Go postal on your kids and abandon faithfulness to God even in your hardships. Patience is willingness to say, yes, I have all of these troubles in my life, but if I have God in my life, if I have God in my circumstances, He is enough. And I can wait even if these troubles do not leave, having the Lord's presence in my life is enough. 
and I can continue. We could look at it this way, and, and this is where the two sermons really start to line up. Uh, true spiritual patience is the very opposite of sinful anger. Sinful anger seeks to accomplish its passions and its desires now. But the patient person, think about this, the patient person never becomes angry. The patient person never loses their cool. They are never, think about this, they are never cast down into despair or cynicism by the foolishness or unteachability of others in their life. They continue to have patient faith in God. They never react in wrath or anger or slander because they are continuing to have patient trust in God. Sinful anger, though, is impatience. That's what sinful anger is. It's impatience. Sinful anger is choosing to not believe that God is just. Sinful anger is choosing to believe that God's judgment will not deal with this problem, therefore I have to deal with this problem. Sinful anger acts as if everything depends on you and nothing depends on your God. God's judgment, God's justice, whether that is in eternal Judgment in hell, or that is on the cross of Christ, is not good enough for me. I need the satisfaction of distributing justice myself. That's what sinful anger is. I need to be the judge. God's sovereign judgment is not good enough for me. Now, that doesn't mean the patient person is apathetic. That doesn't mean they are past feeling like we were talking about today in Ephesians 4.19. No, the patient person actively trusts God's judgment, God's justice, God's place in their life. The patient person is actively putting their trust in God. That is how they can continue and not get angry in a sinful way. A few obvious observations. Number one, this is not the kind of attitude that we see often in our world today, is it? Our world is raging. Our world is foaming with anger. Foaming with impatience. Our world lives for the very next thing. Today means nothing. Justice means nothing. I must be angry. It is like breathing is equivalent with impatience. The whole world is just impatient. And we should also be equally honest with ourselves, right? This is not very easy for us either. It's easy to look out there and say, oh, how angry they are and how impatient they are. But we must admit, as we look at our life and at our home, that it's not often that our lives are characterized by patience either. We find irritation, frustration, resentment over family members very often in our doors as well, especially when they don't do the kinds of things that we want them to do. Let Let me provide a few arguments for why patience is essential for you. Patience is essential for you, number one, because patience, you see this in the Bible, is essential for faith. True, personal, genuine faith, patience is essential to faith. Hebrews 6.12 describes faith and patience within the same breath. It's as if faith is patience and patience is faith. It's the same idea. Hebrews 6.12 says this, Do not be those who become dull, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit promises. Faith is patience and patience is faith. This is the kind of faith that we see modeled in Genesis in the life of Abraham as well. 
patience, this willingness to wait on God is the mark of the true, genuine Christian. The Christian is someone that looks ahead and waits. That's what the Christian is. The Christian is someone characterized by patience in some sense. You are actively believing what God's Word promises will come, and you're willing to wait for it with patience. That's what faith is. You must have patience if you will have faith. Impatience, impatience, on the other hand, is definitely the mark of an unbeliever in their life. The unbeliever is a slave to the satisfaction of of the moment. The the unbeliever lives from one passion to the next, whereas the believer lives on patience for the future. That's what faith is. I'm living for this world or I'm living for the next. We see this in, in Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 13. All these, talking about Abraham and the patriarchs, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been remembering that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they aspire to a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He prepared a city for them. Patience is essential for personal faith. But another argument for patience, patience is also essential for being a part, being a member of the local church. Patience is essential if you want to be here. A few reasons. You are, I don't know if you know this, right now, a covenant member of a group for which Christ has died, but a group nonetheless that is imperfect. No Christian is without sin in their life. And surprise, surprise, they will let you down. But you are a part of a body of believers as imperfect as they are uh, for which Christ has died and, and fully pardoned sins of yesterday, today, and forever fully pardoned through his body on the tree. Christ has died for them. Therefore, you must be patient with them. Because you you must remember that Christ has also died for you. And you must recall that, that Christ Jesus himself has been more patient with you than you will ever need to be with anyone else in this gathering. And when you're in a body of believers, you'll quickly notice as you read through the Bible, right? It's, it's commanded to be patient to one another because of these realities. We even see this in Colossians 3. We have this command, put on patience. Now, it's interesting if you kind of analyze the background of the letter to the Colossians, it doesn't seem as though they had some massive, major, internal church problem. If anything, they were a picture of a church that was strong and healthy, that loved one another and cared for one another. Patience wasn't their big problem. But Paul still writes to them to pursue patience. Why is that? Because even in the best of churches, patience is needed. Patience must be focused on. Patience is always called for. You will continue to need patience. It's essential to be a part of the local church. And and just even thinking about Colossians 3, notice the logic of sanctification even here as well. It's, it's It's imperative to put on patience in the local church. Otherwise, if you don't put on patience, you can never fully put off other things. And then there will be wrath and anger and malice and slander if you do not actively put on the parts of the Christian life that you're called to put on. The Christian community, which doesn't continually strive for the actions and attitudes of verses 12 and 13 here, will fall easy prey to the attitudes and actions of, say, verse 8. It's essential, then, 
Patience is essential if you want to be in the local church. I'm not talking about the universal church. The universal church is easy to love. They never let you down. They never disappoint you. I'm talking about the local church, people that you know. You must have patience if you want to be a part of us. But also, another reason why patience is essential, I would say this, patience is essential if you want to do any spiritual good. Patience is essential. You must possess it if you want to be in the other, in the local church with imperfect believers, for sure, but you, you must possess it if you want to actually seek out the Great Commission. Because, newsflash, it is hard, it is difficult, it requires time and patience. Missionaries need patience, pastors need patience, members need patience. Because pursuing the Great Commission takes time. Matter of fact, all relationships in the church require it. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says this, We urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. That's what every relationship in the church requires. 2 Timothy 4.2 says this is the kind of heart, the kind of heart of a, of a teacher, of a counselor, of someone who wants to speak truth into another person's life. You must be a patient person. Uh, Paul says this in 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience. You can't reprove rebuke and exhort if you don't have great patience and teaching and we and we could even continue on for the the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine you need patience and they will want to have their ears tickled and they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths but you must be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, or add there, be patient. Proverbs 5, 18 thinks about patience as kind of like a good cop skill. A good cop skill. A good cop is someone who doesn't escalate a situation, but de-escalates a situation, right? This is what Proverbs 5.18 says. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger quiets a dispute. Proverbs 25.15 uh, describes patience as something that has incredible influence. It is the characteristic of someone who can persuade Verse 15 of Proverbs 25 says, When one is slow to anger, a ruler, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue breaks the bone. Bottom line, if you want to do any kind of spiritual good for other people in your Christian life, if you want to be of help to sinners, if you want to be a fisher of men, as Christ has called all of his disciples to be, you must be patient or patient, patience is essential. And in case I haven't convinced you yet, two radical examples. Example number one, William Carey, who was a missionary to India, had to labor for seven years before seeing a single convert. I haven't even been here for seven years. But he had to labor for seven years before seeing a single convert to Christ in India. Adoniram Judson, who followed William Carey, but ended up in Burma through no effort of his own, had to work for seven years as well before he saw any fruit whatsoever. Seeking to serve Christ, seeking to do spiritual good for anyone, requires patience. Seeking to do spiritual good requires that you are willing to suffer affliction and resentment and misjudgment. That is patience, and patience is essential. This 
description, though, quickly leads to our second description. Not only is true spiritual patience essential, but true spiritual patience is not of you. You can't do it. It's not of you. Many, I suppose, consider themselves to be relatively patient people. At least until we start breaking open the description of what true biblical patience looks like. You know, the never getting angry kind of type. You know, the kind of type that does intentional spiritual good for other people kind of type. The world's definition of patience, though, is pretty easy to meet, to accomplish, to pat yourself on the back for. You could say, I'm a very patient person as long as the people that I'm patient towards are deserving. The world might say, I'm a very patient person when I feel like it. The world may say, I'm a very patient person as long as I isolate myself. I was a great person until I got a roommate. I was a fantastic person until I got married. I was impressed with myself. I'm a very patient person, the world may say, as long as I steer clear of trying to help anyone. As long as I steer clear of trying to do anything whatsoever in this world of spiritual good for someone else, I'm a very patient person. Turning back to Colossians 3, notice, notice Paul never wants us to get past or escape the understanding of who Christ is and what he has done for us. He he never wants us to just go on to the practical and forget about what Christ has done because he knows that we are quick to trust ourselves and quick to forget the true condition that we are in. But he never wants us to forget, in our obedience even, that even our obedience, even our fruit, is from him, and of him, and to him. Paul always wants us to remember how much we are rooted in God, and how much we are dependent upon God. The patience called for in you also requires God to do an amazing work in you. And it's totally not of you. Just write down Galatians 5.22, and that makes that case. Galatians 5.22 says this, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That is from the Spirit residing within the believer. That is because of the Spirit. The, 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 the Christian attitude of patience is because the Spirit is inside of them bearing fruit and not because of their greatness. And, and, and even watch this now, even, even before you receive the Spirit, what has to happen to you, for you, on your behalf? We see this in verse 12 of chapter 3. You must be God's elect. You must be beloved. You must be made holy. Three things that you cannot do that God must do for you before you can receive even the Holy Spirit. Elect means to be selected, to to be beloved, chosen by God in love before the foundation of the world. If we were to borrow language from Ephesians 1, your actions, your obedience come because God has chosen you. And, and notice the, the idea of election doesn't mean God is indifferent or distant or just kind of selecting willy-nilly. God is actually uh, selecting you in love, choosing some in love. 
And by the way, it's not because you were the best of the bunch. Ephesians 2 is very clear to tell you it's because you were nothing. And you were great examples, future examples of his mercy and grace. That is why he chose you. Notice what Paul also says in 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. God saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he which was given to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Or to go back to Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love by predestining predestining us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Notice, The whole message of the gospel is essentially God's patience and kindness to you. Matter of fact, Romans 2, 4 says, don't think lightly on the riches of God's general kindness and forbearance and patience. These these things are, are meant to lead you to repentance. We even see in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow in His promise, as some consider slowness, but he is patient towards you. The whole gospel of God is God's patience towards sinners. And God is patient towards his weak and erring children even after they come to faith as well. We see this in Psalm 103. Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always contend with us. He will not keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, and He has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. But for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. And as a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear Him. Our, our whole life is an enjoyment, is, an, is a reception of God's patience towards us. We are dependent on His patience. And that's actually wonderful news. That's actually marvelous news. I love the scene in Pilgrim's Progress where Christian is entering into the valley of humiliation. And, and the conversation that he has with Apollyon in that valley is, is one of my favorite conversations in the entire book. Apollyon tries to lure him back saying, I'll cancel all your debts. Apollyon tries to also cause Christian to stumble in doubt and insecurity. One of his fiery darts that he uses to cause Christian to stumble are, are basically, look at how faithless you have been already on this journey. Why do you think this king will love you? And what does Christian say in that moment? That makes his patience all the dearer to me. For he has endured with me not only my past sins, but my present. And he gives grace even to me. True spiritual patience is required in me, but it requires God's power in me all the more and it requires first before i even get to god's power in me it requires god's power and patience towards me and that is tremendous news perhaps you don't consider yourself a very patient person but i would say that's the the very best place to start because patience begins not in you but in a total dependence on god and a trust in Him. You need a perspective, and you need His power. Patience is not of you, for sure. 
And as any good pastor would say, this is just an introduction to our passage. Because this leads us to our, our next description. And finally, maybe finally, we'll actually get to the word patience in our passage. This brings us to our, our third uh, description of spiritual patience. True spiritual patience is never alone. It is essential. It's not of you. But it's never alone. Think about it. Verse 12. So, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There seems to be a clumping here. This is not random. All of these attitudes belong together and almost seem to overlap when you look them up. They build on each other. In fact, you can see this. They move from the inside of the person to the outside of the person, to the actions, to the behavior. They move from the heart condition to the hand conditions in the believer. Paul is describing a progression here. He is clumping all of these together to show what the believer looks like from the inside out. Now, you may doubt that Paul is doing that. You say, it just happens to be those words he puts there. But, but notice, this seems to be Paul's style because in verse 5, he does the exact opposite. In verse 5, he goes from the outer sin, sexual immorality, to the very inward sin, which is what? Greed. That is the core, the root of sexual sin. It is covetousness. It is greed. Paul moves from the outward to the inward. This is what sexual immorality looks like, idolatry of the heart. And here, he's saying, here is what forgiveness looks like. It looks like compassion in the heart. It begins with compassion. Matter of fact, I would say here in verse 12 of Colossians 3, we see here a a powerful chain pulling a massive load. Every link is important. One of the work projects we did on the junior-senior retreat was a what we called a chain in which we grabbed a bunch of wood from a wood pile over there and delivered it over here to a stack of wood. And in order not to wear ourselves down, we formed a chain. One person over there hands it to this person, who hands it to that person, who hands it to that person, who hands it to that person, who hopefully puts it on the pile right, otherwise it all falls down, which may or may not have happened once. What's the thing about chains? Chains can can pull a massive load. uh, Chains can do massive work quickly and effectively. But a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. But here we see a powerful chain, each piece critical to pulling the load. Or you could think of it another way. It could be compared to a a costly pearl necklace. Each piece holds the entire necklace together. If one piece is missing, the necklace does not work. What is the first link in this necklace that we see, in this chain that we see here in Colossians 3, verse 12? The first critical aspect, the the inner part of this man is that he has a heart of compassion, a heart that is characterized by or filled with compassion. A heart, of course, speaks of the, the inner person, the inner mind, the inner emotion. Compassion, of course, speaks of of a heart of mercy, of, of pity, of sympathy. It is a heart that naturally reaches out to people who are difficult rather than pulling away from them. That is what a heart of compassion is. And we see a beautiful illustration of this in, in Christ. In, in Mark 6.34, for example, when He saw the crowds coming, now, maybe you need to step back a little bit to understand this, right? He was trying to get away from the crowds to take a break for a while in Mark 6 because he just learned that his cousin, John the Baptist, was killed and he wanted to take some time to be with the disciples. But when he sees the crowd coming, what does he do? What comes out of him? 
It is a heart of compassion, Mark tells us. It is a heart that is drawn towards them in sympathy, in compassion, because, Mark says, they are in his eyes like sheep without a shepherd. Therefore, he has a heart of compassion towards them. This is what a compassionate heart is. It is an inclination inside of you that goes outward and it goes toward difficult people. Particularly the people that tax you most. That's where you know your heart of compassion. The second link, though, we see in this chain is, is this idea of kindness. It usually refers to benevolence. It usually refers to having a helpfulness about you, doing good for someone else. But if we were to think of this as more of an internal quality, it is a willingness to do good for another. It is a willingness to go to those who are in need. Notice, a, a heart of compassion bleeds into kindness. It leads to the next. Such a heart wants to do good. Such a heart wants to express its kindness in some way. It is concerned for the welfare of the one who is suffering near them. It is concerned. But then our third link, we have humility. Humility is is a virtue that someone possesses when they have a true view of themselves. Not the way they want to think of themselves, but the way God actually views them. And they review themselves, and they view themselves truly as they really are. One of the lines of our church covenant that I really love talks about how we covenant together to have a biblical view of self. That's essentially saying, I am covenanting to have a humble view of myself. I am covenanting to see myself and view myself through the Word of God. It's humbling. It means you know your weaknesses in sin and your weaknesses as a creature, and you look at yourself accordingly. It's very interesting to look at background information because the Greeks didn't really use this word. They didn't really like to think of themselves in the, the concepts that this world word presented. It meant to be low. It meant to be poor. It meant to be powerless. It meant to be unimportant. And they didn't want to think about themselves that way. But as soon as the New Testament comes along and the Gospel comes along, Christians love this idea. Because nothing is better to know than that you are completely 100% dependent on the grace of an infinitely kind God. No more happy place could be found. I will gladly embrace humility if it is before this God. Humility bleeds into the fourth. It bleeds into this This word, gentleness, you see it there. Meekness is in the ESV. It refers to an idea perhaps of being small, not so impressed with yourself. You're not so impressed with yourself at such a level where gentleness comes out. You don't fight back or fight back against wrongs that are committed against you because you are gentle. You you can be unprovoked when sinned against because you are gentle. You have this inability. This is what gentleness is. It's an inability to bite back. Why? Because you have a biblical view of yourself. You are humble. I'm a sinner too. I wouldn't want someone to treat me as I am tempted to treat you. I'm going to be gentle with you. In fact... You are willing to suffer the burdens of another sin. Why? Because you have a heart of compassion and a heart that bleeds into kindness and you want to do them good. Notice this goes back to this idea of humility. All of this requires humility. You you know you have true humility of the soul when you have meekness and gentleness in your behavior towards others. That's when you truly know that you are humble, when you can be wronged and not be wrong. Meekness isn't weakness. It is the greatest of spiritual strengths. It is required to do spiritual good. 
Genesis 6.1 talks about it as a necessary attitude to help and restore sinners. Paul says, brothers, even if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each of you looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. It could also be said that uh, Gentleness is essential for defending the faith, calling people to repentance as well. 2 Timothy 2.25 and 24 says this, the, the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may give them repentance leading to the full knowledge of the truth. Gentleness is required. And that brings us to our fifth link in, in our word, patience. Patience. Only, can you see it? Only if you have these preceding qualities can you have patience. Or to say it another way, true spiritual patience is never alone. It's not just patience that you need. You need a heart of compassion. You need kindness you need humility you need gentleness and meekness patience is never alone so the gentle thought here is you can only be changed towards others truly when your heart is changed from within when the gospel turns your life upside down that is the only time you will ever see true spiritual patience at work. The, the, the truly saved person uh, doesn't go around asking people qualifying questions before they're patient with them. They don't say, oh, what have you done for me lately? They ask questions like, what has God already done for me? How is God currently treating me? And that results in a chain reaction of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Final description in our explanation of true spiritual patience. We've seen it's essential. We've seen that it's not of us. We've seen that it is never alone, but... The, for, the final thing I want to insist on for you tonight, true spiritual patience is not the end. It's not the end. That's not what Paul is focusing on here. This is not the end goal. He's not saying put on all of these things so that you can have patience. There is more that we see the Apostle Paul is after. And can I say this? More that the Spirit of God is after in you. Patience is not the end. Uh, these, these chain links are going somewhere. They're heading in a direction. They have a purpose. They're heading from the inward to the outward. It's a transformation of the heart that is seeking to transform the hands and the actions. Patience isn't just about enduring people. It's about restoring fellowship. That's what patience wants. That's what patience is after. That's the end in mind. It's eager to extend forgiveness when asked, even if it is for the hundredth time. It bears up hoping for that day when the person requests forgiveness. Notice where these chains are going. Verse 13, patience leads to bearing with one another. Patience leads to graciously forgiving each other. These are very striking descriptions. And notice they are, they are more vivid. Uh, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Yeah, those are adjectives. But notice, 
There is a verbal quality to these in verse 13. They are doing something continually, actively. Notice the ing-ness of these words. You're bearing with someone. You're forgiving one another. You're continually doing this. This is, this is like the HD that Paul really wants you to see. I, I, I was just saying all of these things so that you would get to these qualities. Bearing with one another. It means you endure someone who fails, with, fails you and don't treat them as you would prefer, but you instead prefer to endure them a little bit longer. It, it's been said that this is pre-forgiveness. This is ready to forgive. This is eager to forgive. Forgiveness is a very transactional thing. You can't forgive someone if they have not actually requested forgiveness. What do you do until then? You bear with them in love, with a heart of compassion and patience and humility, eager for that day where you can extend forgiveness. But until you do, you are bearing with them. Because you can only truly forgive them when they ask you. But you're bearing with them. Now this isn't a disgruntled or grumpy, I'll grin and bear it. This is, remember, the last link in a lot of links leading up to this. This is a heart of compassion on display. This is a, 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 a kindness of heart, a desire to do them good on display. This is humility on display. This is gentleness on display. Bearing with someone displays all of these qualities. But bearing with someone is not what you're after. What is, what, what is the thing that you're after? Forgiving one another. Mutual restorations. Look at this. Christians, new people whose mind is focused upward can't hold grudges. They hold exactly the opposite. An eagerness to forgive. Here's the look at the patience in the heart. It not only bears ills and mistreatments, it also cheerfully and freely seeks to do spiritual good for others. It is eager to extend forgiveness. But even that is not even the end. Verse 14. We see what the end is. Patience is the promotion of unity under the truth of the Gospel. The patient heart is continually pumping with forbearing and forgiveness to others because of the Gospel. Uh, patience is seeking unity under truth. Not unity under forgetfulness, but unity under true reconciling Forgiveness, patience, putting on love, that is the perfect bond of unity. That is what patience wants. Peace, fellowship together. Now, I know you, you'll say yes, but could you be patient with me? for one more point. It's not even a point. It's like half of a page. But could we tie kind of a, a bow tie around this entire day and ask a question? Can patience and anger really be together in the Christian life? These things seem poles apart. I'd argue that both are essential for the other. First, I would suggest you, you'll never know true patience in your life until you are willing to be angry about the pride and the hostility and the resentment in your heart. Uh, Anger, righteous anger towards your own sin is essential to true patience. 
Otherwise, you'll be cut off at the pass. You will never be able to get out of the heart of compassion because your heart will be full of self-seeking. You'll never have true patience unless you are willing to be truly angry at the sins of your heart. You'll never know true patience. And secondly, true patience will always guard you from sinful anger. True patience will always keep you. True blood-bought patience, a perception that comes from God's patience with you, will always protect you from sinful anger towards others. Sinful, selfish anger. You must have both, or you will have none. That's what we see. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this evening that we get to gather here, hear your word. and pray that your, your truth would sink deeply into our minds and our hearts, and that you would be gracious to us and provoke us again to love and good works. Convict us in the very heart of loving kindness and forgiveness that we may present to you a true church under your truth in unity and love and fellowship. Purify us and bring us peace. Amen.